Zazu. Yes, sire? Take Nala home. I've got to teach my son a lesson. Come, Nala. Simba. Good luck. Simba! Simba, I'm very disappointed in you. I know. You could have been killed. You deliberately disobeyed me. And what's worse, you put Nala in danger. I was just trying to be brave like you. I'm only brave when I have to be. Simba, being brave doesn't mean you go looking for trouble. But you're not scared of anything. I was today. You were? Yes. I thought I might lose you. Oh, I guess even kings get scared, huh? Mm hmm But you know what? What? I think those hyenas were even scared. <laughs> Cause nobody messes with your dad. Come here, you. Oh, no, no! <laughs> ah, uh, ah, come here. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Pals, right? <laughs> right. And we'll always be together, right? Simba, let me tell you something that my father told me. Look at the stars. The great kings of the past look down on us from those stars. Really? Yes. So whenever you feel alone, just remember that those kings will always be there to guide you. And so will I. One of the more depressing but necessary scenes from The Lion King. So what happened before this, for those who haven't seen The Lion King, is Simba goes into the realm of the unknown or the chaotic realm itself. It's the realm that exists outside of the light. You know, it's the realm of shadows. It's the unconquered territory. And of course, when you go into the unconquered territory, you need to be ready to be met with malevolence. And that's exactly what the hyenas represent. Think about hyenas. They're carrion feeders. That means they feed on the discarded carcasses, you know. But at the same time, they look pretty healthy. You know, that elephant graveyard is packed with bones. And yeah, they have strong enough teeth to actually break bones as well. And if that wasn't scary enough, hyenas actually laugh. You know, if it wasn't bad enough that they feed on death and that they can break bones with their teeth, they laugh. You know, so anyway, symbolism wise, though, isn't it interesting that the villain's army is a bunch of individuals that live on the outskirts of society and rely on how well the society is doing. So that way they can rely on the scraps of that society. There's one thing here that you can, you can guess is being weaponized or can be weaponized later on, and that's resentment. But I digress. Enough about the hyenas for now. Simba meets the chaos in the border. And like all great heroes, he's scarred from the occasion. When Mufasa has to save him, that scars Simba. The fact that he almost got his best friend killed, Nala, scars him. And you can see that when Mufasa brings up that you could have got Nala killed. That is a burden. That is a weight on Simba himself. You know, and that's why when he's walking, he's walking in the beginning, he's walking all defeated. You know, he's been defeated by the malevolence. If his father didn't arrive, 
they were dead. And he realizes that, you know? So that's kind of what happened. They, they went into the realm of chaos and that had a lot of symbolism of hell too. For those who actually watched the scene or watched the Lion King, there was a lot of hell symbolism in there with the fire and the lava and the, the three hyenas uh, poking through the flames, you know? There's a lot of that kind of symbolism in the Lion King because if you're going to pick some of the most malevolent and evil creatures or characters, might as well go for the top, you know? or I guess in this case, the bottom one. So... Lion King does that a lot, and we'll go over more of that when we go into Scar's kingdom, of how he's building his kingdom and what he's using. But Simba's scarred from this occasion. But in this particular aspect, he survived. And that is so crucial to Simba, because now he's been humble, you know? And we see that humbling of the hero. When he steps his footprint into Mufasa's and he looks at his, uh, his foot compared to Mufasa's imprint, you know? It's almost like the shoes he has to fill, you know? He has now been humbled. He went from, I just can't wait to be king. I don't need you. I can build my kingdom on happiness and everything, even though it came crashing down. And I laugh in the face of danger is one of the things Simba says, until danger made itself known, and then he cowardly hides behind even Nala, you know, which I think is such a funny clip there. But he's been humbled, and that's so important for the hero. And you should be thinking, why? Why is being humbled so important to the hero? It's the same reason Mufasa has Rafiki as one of his chief advisors. You know, you need to understand that there are things better than yourself. You need to understand that things are greater than you in order for you to learn. Remember what we talked about last time? You need to be willing to play the fool. You need to put yourself in that humbling state before you can learn anything, really. This is what I do. In my introduction to philosophy classes with my first time college students all the time and I do this for a specific reason when my first time college students come to see me okay they are Catholic scholars they are philosophical gurus in their own imagination but then three minutes of Rene Descartes and they're questioning everything Dear, I, I know we have reservations, but one of my former students is having a minor crisis. I'll be there in half an hour. What does it all mean? <laughs> Make it an hour. Now, why? Why is that important? Well, I've alluded to it already, if not said it outright. It's needed in order for an individual to start learning. Now Simba's in a place where he, he can actually learn from his father. He's been humbled enough to now know he does not know anything. And that's such an important place to be. That's where students begin. I mean, take it from a person who's done nothing but study almost nonstop for the last seven years. I feel like I haven't even reached, reached the pinnacle. I've barely scratched the surface. And it's an exciting place because I get to learn. That's where learning begins. I may be a student for the rest of my life. I'll have a lot of knowledge, but I think I'm going to be a student for the rest of my life because I love learning these new things. I love arming myself with the steel armor of knowledge where my most fundamental opinions are now put to tests to see if I can withstand other people's opinions or other people's arguments. That's what I do in my other class. Um, called uh, critical thinking and logic. It's such an important place to be for a hero to be humbled because that's when learning begins. So that's the first part of this clip. The second part that I'm going to focus on, not to say that there's not a lot of other things going on in this clip, because there is, but the second part I'm going to focus on is when 
Simba realizes that even kings get scared. Of course kings get scared. What do you think courage is? You know, courage isn't the absence of fear. That is to say that a courageous person is not someone who is not scared at all. In fact, a person who is not scared, who just runs into battle. Uh, all right, comes up. Ready, guys, Let's or... do this. Leroy Dragons! Oh my God, he just ran. They usually get their entire team killed. No, no, no. Courage is being scared to death, but saddling up anyway, as John Wayne once put it. So it's not an individual who doesn't feel fear. That's not the point. That's not where the test comes in. The test comes in on being scared, having that opposition, having that opposition to you, that wall, and overcoming that wall. You ain't gonna believe this, but you used to fit right here. I'd hold you up to say to your mother, this kid's gonna be the best kid in the world. This kid's gonna be somebody better than anybody ever knew. And you grew up good and wonderful. It was great just watching you. Every day was like a privilege. Then the time come for you to be your own man and take on the world, and you did. But somewhere along the line, you changed. You stopped being you. You let people stick a finger in your face and tell you you're no good. And when things got hard, you started looking for something to blame. Like a big shadow. Let me tell you something you already know. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is gonna hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Now, if you know what you're worth, now go out and get what you're worth. But you got to be willing to take the hits and not pointing fingers saying you ain't where you want to be because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that and that ain't you. You're better than that. So what is Rocky saying right there in that clip? It's the challenge. It's the overcoming of adversity. It's not the the existence of adversity that's the issue. It's how you overcome it. It's not not being scared. It's being scared, being challenged, and overcoming those challenges. So it's how we approach challenges in and of themselves. That is to say, it's how we approach challenges that determine who we are. It's what great authors write about, you know? We don't want to hear a story about an individual who just goes in and conquers everything without any resistance. There's a reason why Superman was failing as a comic book until kryptonite came in. They had to invent kryptonite in order to make it interesting because nobody wanted to read a Superman who shows up does everything without an ounce of conflict, you know? Not only did we not like it, we have to think why we didn't like it, why the public disregarded it and found it boring. I believe, honestly, it's because it wasn't realistic. We all reach, uh, we all come up against conflicts. So that was one thing. And another thing is, we read for the conflict. Like I told you guys in the introduction to stories, when I was when I gave you that example of cutting the uh, cutting the zip ties around my hand with my own shoelaces, you know, you want to hear how the individual gets out of the situations. You know, we want to read how Batman deals with the Joker. You know, we want to read how Thor deals with Loki. We want the conflict. We want to understand the conflict and then figure out how they overcome it. That's what makes stories, really, not even the great stories, stories in particular. That's why we tell stories, you know, in, in some particular. So other, other times we actually tell stories 
because we want to isolate the the overall being, but you know that's that can get really esoteric really fast. The point is, we read stories to identify with the conflict, and as Rocky is saying here, it's the conflict that makes you who you are. How you deal with the conflict in your life is how you will be judged. You know, in this example, his son is blaming him. He's the son is blaming Rocky for his crappy life. But he's like, you let a person stick a finger in your face and tell you you're not worth anything, all right? That's not the point. The point is you started believing it. You built this big shadow that you could blame everything on, you know? That's the problem with victimhood mentality, you know? You always have something to blame. We all do. We all have conflicts that are usually not in our creation, you know? Other times we do, and honestly, I think those hurt more. You know, ignoring the sound in your car until it breaks down at the worst time and, you know, things unfold because of that. Those are terrible situations of our own making. But there are many conflicts that aren't of our making, and we are going to have to deal with those as well, you know? And that's the point. It's not that we don't have any conflicts. The point is how we deal with them. And that's what's being said right here when Mufasa is talking to Simba. I was scared, you know, but it was Mufasa overcoming the fear that makes him such a great king. It wasn't the cushy life of just can't wait to be king. That's going to make you a great king. Not at all. It's the trials, you know. It's like the great ship boat captain that says he's great because he navigated through the hurricane and stayed the course. It's not the one who says they're a great captain, but have only sailed in calm waters. You know, which one would you want as your captain when things get rough? It's the tests and the conflicts that define who you are. And that's what Mufasa is saying here. Conflict hardens you. Conflict gets you ready for other conflict. Conflict becomes the gold star. It becomes the achievement point that you could throw on your back. You know, when you're young and you have to deal with a serious conflict and you get through it, that actually becomes a badge of honor later on in your life where you can say, hey, things are bad now. But man, they were worse at that time and I got over it. I can do it here. You see what conflict adds to you? It straightens up your back. It sharpens your teeth, metaphorically speaking. It hardens you to future conflict. It better steals your resolve against future conflict. It's not that conflict's not going to arise. That is unrealistic. In fact, it's boring. No, it's how we handle the conflict. So that way we can throw it in our backpack of gold star achievements throughout life. It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frugal. The ones that really mattered. Full of darkness and danger they were. And sometimes you didn't want to know the end. Because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad had happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing. This shadow, even darkness must pass. A new day will come. And when the sun shines, it'll shine out the clearer. Those were the stories that stayed with you meant something, even if you were too small to understand why. But I think, Mr. Frodo, I do understand. I know now. Folk in those stories had lots of chances of turning back, only they didn't. They kept going. See, as Samwise is saying here, that's the great stories. It's at times where things got so tough they wanted to turn back, but they didn't anyway. And let me give you a real-world example, okay? My first time teaching in middle school, 
not in college. This was fairly recent. My first time teaching in middle school was during the lava flow. Before the lava flow, before we even thought it was going to be a thing, I challenged my middle school students to finish the Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship in the Ring, in one semester. And that is a pretty thick book for us to finish as a group in one semester, especially since, as you can imagine, I can bring a lot of philosophy into small little segments. So it was a challenge, and I expected it to be a challenge. But what we didn't ex expect as a group was for the school we worked at to be taken out by lava. That's right. I worked at Kuokula. Their school got destroyed by lava, and I was in the epicenter. I was there when we were dealing with the 12 to 13 seismic activities when we were down right by the shores. This is what we dealt with. I didn't see my students for two to three weeks after the school got destroyed, and I wasn't able to teach them. We were trying to figure out where we were going to relocate. Okay, so we lost three weeks of instruction. We were able to find a place in Boys and Girls Club. So there we were in Boys and Girls Club, lost three weeks of academics. The school was destroyed. We need to restructure. I did grab the Lord of the Rings books. So we had the Lord of the Rings books. And what were we going to do? But I told them we can either quit. And nobody will say anything about it. They'll be like, well, of course you did. Or we can finish this book. We can finish what we started. And from now to the end of your lives, you can say you, with your middle school teacher, finished the book amid disaster. And boy, oh boy, did they want that gold star. Did they want to be able to tell their parents and future people that, what do you mean you couldn't finish your book? Our school got destroyed by lava, and I still finished that book. And we did. And now they can say that for the rest of their lives. The conflict was so large that it became an opportunity. It became an opportunity to use that example for the rest of their life. And that's the point, as Samwise is saying here. We could have turned back, and people would have been like, yep, yeah, I would have too. Or... We could, we could have overcame it and gone forward and you guys would have a trophy that no one can take away from you. So as you see, your achievements don't necessarily stay in the backpack. They become part of you. Bruce, deep down you may still be that same great kid you used to be. But it's not who you are underneath. It's what you do that defines you. So that's what's being stated here. You are not the things that you are born into. Who you are is a combination of the decisions that you've made. And it's a very deep existential philosophy. One pioneered by such great philosophical geniuses like Nietzsche and Sartre and Kierkegaard and Heidegger and Dostoevsky. You know, this is a very complex theory in philosophy. But... You can understand it by looking at these great stories. It's not who you are in the inside that matters. It's what you do with your life. It's how you approach conflict. It's how you overcome adversity. And it's staring us right in the face with every story we read. It's staring us in the face when people watch Olympic skaters who travel on the very edges of danger, where they could fall at any moment, and we watch something spectacular, and everybody stands up and applauds, you know? What is that? It's people watching other people overcome adversity to the point of destruction and overcome it. We celebrate that. It makes people emotional, you know? I cannot watch the ending of Secretariat without getting emotional. The fact that Secretariat was running against Sham and Sham's owner tells, for those of you who don't know, Secretariat is a racehorse. Uh, Sham was the second best racehorse of that time. But Sham's owner, during the 
Maine Derby, the owner wants to run Secretariat until Secretariat's heart explodes. They want to run Secretariat into the mud. They believe that their horse has stronger stamina. So they want Secretariat, who had great speed, to run out of energy. But what happens? All right. For this tremendous Belmont State. Everybody's in line and they're off. Looks like the early lead goes to Mike Gallant. Yes, Mike Gallant going for the lead was quite suppressed on the outside. Secretary to weigh very well, has good position on the rail, and in fact is now going up with the leader. They're moving for the first turn. It is Secretariat. Sham on the outside is also moving along strongly. And now it's Sham. Sham and Secretariat are right together into the first turn. Mike Gallant has third behind them. Then it's twice the Prince, and the trailer is Private Smiles as they go by the turn. Those two together, Sham on the outside. Sham getting ahead in front as they move around the turn with Secretary at second. Then there's a large gap. Make it eight lengths back to Mike Gallon in third and Vice of Prince fourth. And Private Smiles is still the trailer. They're on the back stretch. It's almost a match race now. Secretariat's on the inside, by a head. Sham is on the outside. They've opened 10 lengths on Mike Gallant, who is third by a head, with Vice of Prince fourth. Then it's another eight lengths back to Private Smiles, who is trailing the field. They continue down the back stretch, and that's Secretariat now taking the lead. He's got it by about a length and a half. Still Sham, 10 lengths back, Mike Gallant, Vice of Prince. They're moving on the turn now. For the turn at Secretariat, it looks like he's opening. The lead is increasing. They get three, three and a half. He's moving into the turn. Secretariat holding on to a large lead. Dan is second, and then it's a long way back to my gallon and twice a print. They're on the turn, and Secretariat is blazing along. The first three quarters of a mile in 109 and four fifths. Secretariat is brightening now. He is moving like a tremendous machine. Secretariat by 12. One lengths away from Sham. And people still talk about it to this day. It gives me chicken skin just thinking about it. The owner wanted to push this horse to the edge of disaster. And the people in the audience were watching it. And as Secretariat pulled away to win by 31 lengths, they knew they were watching something spectacular. That's what people do. It's how individuals overcome adversity that people talk about. It's how people overcome adversity that defines their character. Who you are on the inside, according to this theory, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you were born, what sex you are, what color skin you have. You can be a hero or, or a villain just as easy. It's what you do in life that makes you who you are. And that's what Mufasa wants to focus on. You know, Simba, you were born a prince, but you are not a king. It's not the absence of fear. It's being scared to death and saddling up anyway. So what we're really looking at here is meaning. What gives life meaning? And to that, we go to the end of the clip. So Mufasa looks up into the stars and says, if you ever lose your way, look up into the sky. Now, this means a lot of things, but I'm going to focus on a few of them. To, and I'll try to keep this as coherent as possible with what we've discussed so far. So Mufasa says, look up in the sky. The great kings of the past exist up there. So if you ever find your way, look up 
and they'll be there and I'll be there too. Now, what's interesting about this is the knowledge that you have now came from somewhere. The culture, the civilization built around you came not from you, but from other people. They were able to conquer and stabilize this kingdom with knowledge. That's to say that they've conquered this kingdom in a particular way. There is knowledge in the way they have controlled their borders. It's not to say that all the knowledge is there. I'm not, I'm not taking a pure conservative view here that we should not learn anything new. That's not the point at all. But what Mufasa is giving respect to here is a kind of conservative ideal, which is where we are right now was built by people in the past, okay? What worked throughout civilizations, many civilizations, is what we're relying on right now. And there's deep knowledge there, you know? How we build our houses, how we structure our lives, how we identify chaos. These are all handed down knowledge, you know, and it's knowledge we kind of take for granted. So if you ever lose your way, and this is kind of what he's saying here, when you go out into the world, all right, and you are surrounded by brand new experience, what is it you're going to hold on to? And what Mufasa is saying here is, hold on to the lessons that got you there in the first place. Stay open, like Zazu, to the information around you. But still, when all else fails, stick to the tried and true traditions that got you there in the first place. There's a lot of wisdom in how the elders carved out the very world you exist in right now. This can get really complicated, and it's a phenomenal aspect to deep evolutionary psychology, but I'm not going to get too deep into that. But that's kind of what Mufasa is saying, you know? You are going to go out into the world, and you're going to meet new challenges. Now, you can either grumble about those challenges or wish they didn't happen to you. I wish the ring had never come. I wish none of this had happened. So do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. Or as Gandalf said right there, you can ask yourself, what are you going to do with the time given to you? And I am often asked this by my college students because they're first time college students. They're going into a brand new world. And they ask me, you know, how do I figure out what I'm going to do with my life? You know, and it's such a powerful statement, you know, and it's a large weight, not only on them, but now for me, because they're asking me, you know, what do I do for the rest of my life? What can I do here? And so I tell them, well, using the knowledge of those around you. So incorporating more than just yourself. You know, because that's kind of what Mufasa is saying here, too. You know, the self, the self-interest doesn't go very far. As the beginning quote said, one of the worst things to happen is you go through life and your road ends at yourself. You haven't grown at all, you know. So keeping that in mind and the fact that self-interest is so minute in its affected area. And that the farther you get and the more people you incorporate, the more meaning you find. And honestly, the more chaos is held at bay. Think about that, you know, the way individual needs kind of just help you and maybe those immediately around you, just selfish individual needs. But cultural needs seem to tie everyone together, you know, and we as humans, we love that aspect. That's why we celebrate things in social circumstances. And the more people there to celebrate, the better feeling we have, you know? It gives meaning to things. But anyway, I, I, I'm getting sidetracked. So taking that into account, 
that self-interest really goes only so far, I ask my students, well, what do you enjoy that you are also very good at and can help as much people as possible? All right. You want to pick something you're good at because it kind of gives you a head start. But you also want to pick something you enjoy so it gets you through the hard times. And if it helps a lot of people, that's where the meaning comes from. So when you're choosing a career, that kind of narrows your vision right there. But when you're choosing your career, you should ask yourself, how is this going to be good for me? How is it going to be good for future me? How is it going to be good for my family? And how is it going to be good for society? That's how you take into account what Ufas is talking about here. That's how you take into account more than just your individual needs. The answer provides you with a path, a roadmap, and the foundations for you to be successful while bestowing upon you a well that you can drink from when adversity strikes and makes you thirsty. See you next time.